Today's insightful uh, sharing, first and foremost, let me introduce myself. My name is Fala Muhammad, President of New Malaya UNESCO Club. And on behalf of today's organizer, New Malaya Center for Civilizational Dialogue and co-organizer, New Malaya UNESCO Club, uh, alongside Angkatan Belia Islam Malaysia, ABIM, and with the great support by the Embassy of the Republic of Azerbaijan, I welcome all of you to today's highly anticipated event entitled Azerbaijani Cultural, Historical and Muslim Heritage that was special guest of honour, His Excellency Irfan Davudov, Dr. Rafiq Rustamov and Mr. Muhammad Faisal Abdul Aziz. <laughs> Welcome and Selamat Datang, His Excellency and Dr. <coughs> Thank you for being with us today. His Excellency, Professor, Doctor, and all respected ladies and gentlemen. It is also my greatest honor to thank all who have put tremendous amount of effort towards materializing today's event, namely Prof. Dato. Dr. Azizan Baharudin, <laughs> Associate Professor Dr. Duria Sharifa Hassan Adli, Mr. Ahmad Mohammad, Mr. Chang Lewi, Madam Liza, and Madam Ita. A round of applause for the team. As today's topic, we'll also be sharing on culture, which is in line with UNESCO's aim in embracing culture. We believe in protecting and safeguarding the world's cultural and natural heritage and supporting creativity. As UNESCO is convinced that no development can be sustainable without a strong culture component. Indeed, only a human-centered approach to development based on mutual respect and open dialogue among cultures can lead to lasting peace. Now, His Excellency, Prof. Dato, without further delay, it is my greatest honor to introduce the Director of New State Malaya Center for Civilizational Dialogue, a highly prominent figure who specializes in several areas such as environmental ethics, religion and sustainable development, Islam and science, bioethics, interfaith and inter-civilizational dialogue, who also has published more than 200 books, book chapters, monographs, journal articles and newspaper articles in the above mentioned fields. Ladies and gentlemen, let us put our hands together for Professor Dato Dr. Aziza Binti Baharudin to deliver the welcome remarks. Thank you, Madam uh, Swaila. I guess it's safe enough for me to take off my mask, yeah? <laughs> <laughs> Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Wa salatu wa salamu ala ashrafil anbiya wa musaleen wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Bishrah li sadri wa yasir li amri wa lukdata min lisani ya kau kauli. Allahumma salli ala sahbihi Muhammad. Just a tiny wini prayer so that our meeting today will be blessed and that uh, we are very happy to have all of you here today. Thank you so much. So, Your Excellency, uh, Mr. Irfan Davudov, Ambassador Extraordinary and Plenipotentiary of the Republic of Azerbaijan to Malaysia, uh, Yang Berbahagia and Respected Dr. Rafiq Rustanov, First, uh, no sorry, Councillor of the Embassy of uh, Azerbaijan to Malaysia, um, Yang Berbahagia Saudara Muhammad Faizal Abdul Majid, President of the Muslim Youth Movement of Malaysia, or ABIM. Uh, Prof. Hamdi Adnan, Head of Department Media and Communications. I think he is on his way. Uh, yang berbahagia, Associate Professor Dr. Duryah Sharifah Hassan Adli, Research Fellow of uh, UMCCD. Associate Professor Embung Kui, Head of Department Science and Technology Studies, Faculty of Science. Nice to see you. Associate Professor Dr. Roy Anthony Rogers. Department of International and Strategic Studies, Prof. Thank you so much. Associate Professor Wendy Yi Metian, Head of Center for Internship Training and Academic Enrichment, Muslim Layer. Of course, Mrs. Suhaila Muhammad, our uh, President of the Muslim Layer UNESCO Club. Uh, lecturers, ladies and gentlemen, uh, everyone in the audience. Uh, I know many of you are especially from ABIM and from the club and other departments of the university. Uh, welcome. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh and a very good morning. So it is indeed our uh, great pleasure at the centre to have you at this second only physical meeting of the centre. 
<laughs> thus far, people are just faces on the screen and you sort of wave and all that. So today, we can actually shake hands, inshallah. And hopefully, um, thank you to the uh, sponsorship of the embassy. We have uh, meals together at lunchtime, inshallah. Okay, first of all, uh, uh, Your Excellency, uh, it's our great honor and joy uh, to be able to have the embassy uh, recognize us in terms of our ability to have this event with you. And also, our heartfelt thanks to Abim for their continuous support. They are our network partner. And uh, the center believes in uh, working with uh, partners inside and outside of the campus, of course. And we have some partners overseas, but of course, because of the situation all over the world, we cannot uh, travel very much. Uh, uh, Datuk Rashma, forgot to mention Datuk Rashma, uh, our ex ambassador to the United States. Thank you, uh, Datuk, for being here as well. <laughs> so, we are full of diplomacy today. So, everyone, please behave. Yeah? Uh, so, like uh, Suhaila has mentioned, um, we are now also planetary citizens. Besides being citizens of Malaysia, Azerbaijan, and elsewhere that we come from, China, just now I heard. We are also planetary citizens. So what does that mean? If you would allow me, if you look at the uh, what the preamble of the Earth Charter says, it says we stand at a critical moment in Earth's history, a time when humanity must choose its future. As the world becomes increasingly interdependent and fragile, the future at once holds great peril and also great prom promise. To move forward, we must recognize that in the midst of magnificent diversity of cultures and the life forms we are, one human family and one earth community with a common destiny. We must join together to bring forth a sustainable global society founded on respect of nature, human rights, economic justice and a culture of peace. Towards this end, it is imperative that we, the people of the earth, declare our responsibility to one another and to the greater community of life and to future generations. Some people might be cynical and say, ha ha ha, big words, yeah, it doesn't impact me, but it is true. If you think about the oxygen that you breathe in, if you think about the air, if you think about the viruses, if you think about the oceans, these are all planetary items. They don't belong to any country. So because by virtue of the fact that we need these elements of nature, yeah, and also we are all interconnected because of the systems, economic systems and whatnot uh, of the world, we are um, uh, owing ourselves this great responsibility to understand each other and to work for the betterment of all of us. And so today we are very lucky to have His Excellency to speak to us about Azerbaijan in particular and later after that Dr. Rafiq uh, on a specific issue of uh, the historical and cultural uh, Muslim heritage. Yeah? I don't know whether that heritage is in danger or, or, or whatever the situation is, but certainly uh, Mr. Faisal, it is our duty to listen and think uh, what we can do together, Your Excellency, to maintain uh, heritages of all the uh, groups uh, on the face of the earth because cultural diversity is just as important as biodiversity. We all understand the importance of biodiversity, which is being destroyed at a rapid rate, uh, pace, but cultural diversity is also decreasing at a very alarming rate. So if we destroy cultural diversity, in a sense, we are decreasing our humanity. So for us at the centre, this is why this event is very significant today. And those of us who are not here, they are either stuck in the jam or something like that. <laughs> but the numbers uh, that registered were many actually. So inshallah, maybe they'll be trickling in. So with that, I say thank you so much also to Halal Centre. Uh, this room belongs to Halal Centre in a sense. Uh, but the whole building, High Impact Research Building, is uh, commonly used for everyone. So i like to welcome you again in the future here or upstairs or anywhere else or on campus. And uh, with that, I end. We like to be Wahidaya. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. And thank you so much once again. So I stay here. Anadia. Thank you, Prodato, for the insightful opening remarks. Now, without further ado, I would like to invite um, His Excellency Irfan Davudov, Ambassador of the Republic of Azerbaijan to Malaysia, to deliver his. Assalamu alaikum rahmatullah wa barakatuh. Good morning, everybody. It's uh, my pleasure to be together with you today. I welcome all of you. I would like to thank to 
the Center for Civilizational Dialogue of the University of Malaya for this event, also for UNESCO Club as well. Uh, dear friends, uh, of course, um, uh, today's event is dedicated to a, to a topic that is very important, not only for Azerbaijan, I think, but for uh, the Islamic world and humankind as a whole. Dr. Rafik Rustamov will uh, provide detailed information on the state of national and cultural her heritage, historical heritage belonging to Azerbaijanis in the occupied for nearly 30 years of territories of Azerbaijan, as well as the historical territories of Azerbaijan known today as the Republic of Armenia. You know, uh, maybe you are aware, maybe not, in uh, several words, I would like to inform you about uh, this uh, situation. Uh, maybe you are aware that uh, Azerbaijan regained its independence in 1991 from uh, the Soviet Union as a result of the collapse of the Soviet Union. And from the first days of our independence, we faced very huge problems, economic problems, social problems, uh, political problems, and so on. Uh, every, every republic in the former Soviet Union faced such problems, but uh, Azerbaijan's situation was even more difficult because we faced also uh, direct uh, foreign military aggression from the side of Armenia and using the uh, political economic chaos in Azerbaijan in the first years of independence, Armenian armed force occupied 20% of Azerbaijani territories. 20%, one uh, fifth part of Azerbaijan uh, was occupied, and uh, such a situation created very huge problems foreign policy problems, domestic problems for Azerbaijan. We had uh, 1 million refugees and uh, internally displaced persons. At that time, our population in total was uh, uh, 8 million, and at the same time, we had 1 million of internally displaced persons. Persons and you can imagine how uh, huge problems the, this uh, number created for Azerbaijan: economic problems, social problems, political problems, and so on. And uh, during uh, in the 19, <coughs> 19, uh, uh, 94, we had a ceasefire agreement with Armenia. The war was stopped. But Armenian uh, forces remained in these occupied territories. And uh, we began negotiating with Armenia about the uh, resolution of the conflict. Uh, moderator was uh, OSCE Minsk Group, so called, with the uh, uh, co chairs by, uh, from Russia, United States, and France. But during these 30 years, we had no I would say success in negotiations. Armenia refused to uh, fulfill United Nations Security Council resolutions on withdrawal Armenian armed force from Azerbaijan territories, uh, and uh, they refused. They, they 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 ignored the position of the international community, principles and norms of international law, uh, refusing to withdraw their armed force from Azerbaijan territories. As a result of, uh, how to say, resultless negotiations, in 2020, Azerbaijan had to liberate its territories by armed force, you know, and uh, we restored our territorial integrity in the September, November 2020. And after liberating our territories, we faced the situation which we could not imagine at the time of occupation. Of course, that time we knew, uh, we knew that Armenian side destroyed everything in, uh, everything in occupied territories. They destroyed the roads, railways, bridges, uh, homes. If you see, Mr. Rafik will uh, probably uh, demonstrate some pictures from these uh, liberated territories. Uh, you can imagine it as a Hiroshima after uh, uh, nuclear bombing. As uh, the same picture is there right now, everything destroyed. But at the same time, they destroyed uh, cultural heritage monuments, mosques. Only one example I would like to uh, bring into your attention. Before the conflict, we had 68, 67 mosques operating in these territories. Now only three 
mosque are remained there. All others were destroyed and uh, completely destroyed. And uh, these three mosques, two in Shusha, one in Agdam city, they used as a uh, milit for military purposes. The minarets was used to coordinate the artillery shooting. For this reason, they didn't destroy it, but they used these mosques as a stable for cattle and pigs to, to, to humiliate the uh, religious, the national feelings of, of Azerbaijani people. Uh, and today, as uh, we have this event as organized by UNESCO Club, I would like to speak about the position of UNESCO as the international organization on this issue. During the conflict, Azerbaijani side occasionally applied to UNESCO Secretariat to send uh, assessment mission, fact-finding missions to the occupied territories to estimate the situation with the uh, situation of uh, cultural heritage monuments of Azerbaijan in these territories. But uh, UNESCO Secretariat every time rejected it uh, with the reference that they are not political organization, it, uh, the issue must not be politicized, and so on. But uh, when we liberated our territories, the UNESCO Secretariat, the UNESCO Secretary General began speaking about the danger from the side of Azerbaijan to Armenian heritage in these territories, in spite of the fact that no Armenian heritage uh, are there in these liberated territories. We have some monasteries, some churches in these territories belonging not Armenians, but uh, Azerbaijani, Udin, Christian uh, community, and Azerbaijani state, Azerbaijani government are protecting this monument as a uh, Christian heritage of Azerbaijani people. Uh, and uh, we, 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 we consider such an approach from the side of UNESCO as a reflection of, as a uh, double standards uh, in at, uh, attitude to Azerbaijan and other states, and we think that it must not uh, take place, such an attitude, such an approach. Uh, so, uh, I, 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 I'm not going to waste your time. Mr. Rafik, Dr. Rafik will uh, introduce all information about this situation, and uh, you will uh, see everything by your own eyes and uh, now I would like to um, conclude my this uh, speech by giving floor to my, uh, Dr. Rafik if uh, by your permission no okay thank you very much for your attention and I think after uh, we can exchange our uh, in uh, Question answer session. Okay. Token of appreciation to. Now we would like to hand over token of appreciation. Okay, thank you, Prodato, and uh, thank you, His Excellency. Okay, uh, based uh, on your speech that you, uh, was delivered just now, we look forward to uh, further future uh, exchange of ideas and views 
uh, in future collaboration for the betterment of both uh, Azerbaijan and Malaysia. So without further delay now, I would like to also invite uh, Sir Professor Dr. Duriah Sharifah Hassan Adli uh, to continue with the next session. But before that, let me introduce you. Uh, let me just read your bio here. Okay, last year, um, here, UMCCD welcomed Associate Professor Dr. Sharifa Sharif, Dr. Duria Sharifa Hassan Adli to UMCCD as a research fellow after her long service in the Biohealth Science Program, Institute of Biological Sciences, ISB, Faculty of Science as an academic staff specializing in neuroscience, which she started after studies in the USA. Dr. Duria has been involved at various levels of administration in UM at most times in establishing and or developing specific system for future use. For example, at the university level, she was in the core team setting up UM Quality Management System or UM QMS, which prepared UM as an organization ready to succeed in its different quest. She also helped develop and led the Institutional Animal Care and Use Committee, UMIACUC, to its current established status. With such a background and having had the experience as a Deputy Head of ISB in charge of academics and student affairs, Dr. Duria assumed the role of the advisor to the UM UNESCO Club, UMUC, naturally. To date, other than contributing to the various UMCCD and UMUC activities, she has also been part of programs like the Forum Interfaith Dialogue on Mental Health Issues, a youth-related forum on Hari Malaysia celebration, and participated as one of the facilitators in the ASEAN Universities Alliance Youth Program 2022, AUAYFM. We trust that Dr. Duria will continue to be MUC's guiding hand. Dr. Duria, the floor is yours. Uh, okay, uh, I've got to speak louder. Thank you, uh, Madam Suhaila. Uh, Madam Suhaila is actually the president of the UNESCO Club. Uh, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum and a very good morning, distinguished guest, uh, especially His Excellency Irfan Davudov, uh, Dr. Rafiq Rustamov, uh, who will be delivering the special lecture today on behalf of UNESCO Club. Since I'm the advisor of the club, I would like to welcome all of you here today. Yeah? Uh, it is really an honor for us that you have taken uh, time from your busy schedule to be here with us in the morning. And I think Prof. Aziz, uh, Azizan has uh, eloquently, uh, eloquently shared with you uh, our gratitude, our thankfulness, and our happiness to have you with us today. Uh, it is my pleasure to be a moderator for this talk, which has been actually been mooted uh, during the visit of both uh, our ambassador uh, and also Dr. Rafiq to the Centre on January 26, 2022, uh, to initiate collaboration with the Centre. Uh, in order to highlight the importance of the dialogue of civilization and uh, especially to the younger generation, uh, this, this special lecture has been organized. Yeah? So um, I think I should just go ahead and uh, to introduce our speaker for today, uh, Dr. Rafiq Rustamov. Uh, first of all, I have already told him in Malaysia we normally use the first name, Dr. Rustamov, rather, uh, Dr., sorry, Dr. Rafiq rather than Dr. Rustamov, which is the norm in the Western uh, uh, countries and all, right? Uh, so in, so here I will be referring to you as Dr. Rafiq. Okay, all right. So Dr. Rafiq graduated from the prestigious Ankara University, Turkey uh, in 2001, and he received his PhD from the University on International Relations. Uh, Dr. Rafiq joined the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Azerbaijan in 2008, and his post was, surprise, surprise, Consulate General in Turkey, of course, uh, between 2009-2012. Uh, he has also worked as a vice counsel and counsel at the Consulate General of Azerbaijan in Los Angeles, United States of America in 2013 to 2017. And uh, Dr. Rafiq actually has been here quite some time because he, in 2009, he was appointed as the first secretary of the Embassy of Azerbaijan to Malaysia. 
And now, uh, since 2021, he's the counselor or the deputy head mission of the embassy in Kuala Lumpur. Yeah? Uh, so I think without further ado, I would like to welcome uh, Dr. Rafiq Rustamov to deliver the special lecture, uh, Azerbaijani Historical, Cultural and Muslim Heritage. Uh, this the lecture will take about one hour or so, right? Okay. And uh, we will have the question and answer session at the end of it. So, please. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Salamat pagi, salamat sejahtera, and good morning. I also join my ambassador uh, to express gratitude to the University of Malaysia, UNESCO Club, Center for Civilizational Dialogue, and Ankatambelia Islam Malaysia for hosting this nice event. Actually, uh, today my presentation will focus on two main topics. Uh, if we see the uh, general title of the event, Azerbaijan Historical, Cultural, and Muslim Heritage. To be honest, this is very wide title because Azerbaijan coming from being a very ancient history. So in this regard, I will focus on two main subjects. First, historical, cultural, Muslim, religious heritage of Azerbaijan that was under military occupation of neighboring Armenia. Uh, for almost 30 years. The same, second main topic will be focusing on cooperation experience of Azerbaijan with UNESCO. Um, so, can we proceed? Yes. Um, frankly, uh, Azerbaijan is, I mean, located in a region very far from Malaysia. So, uh, first I will give some introductory notes about the historical political background of the matter. As you uh, may see, as you can see from the map, Azerbaijan lies at the shore of Caspian Sea. And neighbor to Russia to the north, Georgia to the west, uh, Iran and Turkey to the south, uh, and we have autonomous republic, Nakhchivan, you can see just close to Armenia. And we have very narrow border with Turkey, almost 11 kilometers. And, um, and Armenia to the southwest. Azerbaijan today um, have almost 10 million population. And uh, the total area is eight. Uh, no, no. Uh, 86.6 thousand square kilometers and uh, climate nine out of 11 existing climate zone. Uh, we have, I mean, uh, absolute maximum temperature, dry grasslands, subtropical temperate and absolute minimum temperature. So next title is Islam in Azerbaijan. So just to introduce uh, the Islamic heritage, I have to give some uh, brief notes about it. First contact with the Islam uh, happened during the Caliph Omar's radiallahu anhu uh, between, I mean, in the uh, 7th century. Today, as of today, uh, Azerbaijan is a Muslim majority country, almost 96%. Uh, Constitutional Azerbaijan is a secular state. <coughs> But uh, how Azerbaijan deals with the religious affairs? This is just sample brief notes. Religious affairs in Azerbaijan. Uh, we have Caucasus Muslim boards as a non-governmental organization, like Majlis Agama Islam in Malaysia. And second, we have State Committee on Religious Association of the Republic of Azerbaijan. This is completely government agency, like Jakim in Malaysia, just for your general imagination. Yes. According to the State Committee of Azerbaijan today, uh, Azerbaijan has 975 religious as associations registered. And uh, 938 of them are Islamic, 37 non-Islamic. Uh, I mean, it's from Buddhist organization to Christian organization and etc. 
number of registered religious education institutions, I mean, we have theology, universities, some religious colleges, the number is 11. Number of mosques, I mean, uh, all the Azerbaijan, 2,250. Can we proceed? Uh, you know, today I have something important to say as an aside. Uh, when I started to research this topic, uh, I found that we have, because, uh, I mean, considering Azerbaijan is very far from uh, Malaysia, but we can find some common values in regard of Islam. This gentleman is uh, probably former uh, Duta Besar of Indonesia to uh, Azerbaijan. In one of his interviews to Azerbaijani media, he stressed that um, it was the, an Azerbaijani first time brought religion of Islam to Indonesia in 15th century. Probably we can imagine it as a wider Nusantara, if I'm not mistaken, right? So uh, I think that our grandfathers exchanged some experience. Mm. Probably many people traveled, I mean, for religious reasons, for trade, commerce, I don't know. But they had some kind of exchange of experience. This is another good point. Uh, actually, I was surprised when I uh, found this fact. This is uh, from the ambassador of Indonesia. And can we, yes, do you see, this is the left one. This is very traditional Azerbaijani man wearing our national cap. And this polite, I'm a handsome guy from Malaysia, this <laughs> young gentleman. So what, Pechi Songkong, we, uh, we call it this cap in Azerbaijan, Papak. Yes, one, in one of uh, sources that I prepared myself for this lecture, I found that um, when our grandfathers moved here, probably they brought this papak as a, so there is some kind of exchange of experience. So we call it papak. This, is, this can be another good example, yes, between Azerbaijan and Southeast Malaysia. But now Azerbaijanis use this papak just only uh, national celebrations, national holidays. Yeah. Yes, uh, when I prepared my notes for this event, I found this passage from the event flyer of uh, Dr. Azizan and her team very impressive. The, over the past five decades, too many issues related to the differences in faith, ethnicity, opinion, perception have emerged. Exactly true. This is, uh, you know, completely correct assessment uh, in Azerbaijan case as well. So Azerbaijan also experienced very hard tests derived from misperception of neighboring uh, Armenia about ethnic differences in late uh, 80s. To quickly sum up, uh, can we proceed? Azerbaijan, uh, Karabakh, Karabakh region of Azerbaijan has historically always been an inseparable part of Azerbaijan. We have some basic facts from the history. Treaty of Krakchai, which was signed between Khan of Karabakh, Ibrahim uh, Khan, and the representative of Russian Emperor, General Pavel Tsisyanov, in uh, 18, I mean, uh, five. So, uh, you know, if you check this treaty, you will see Karabakh is represented by Azerbaijanis. There is nothing even sim single and simple referred to Armenia. And uh, we, if we proceed with the, another treaties, Kulistan and Turkmen Chai treaties, you will say the same fact. But um, the question is that how Armenia's Armenian population came to these lands, Azerbaijani lands. Probably this is some uh, strategy of Russian Empire. Uh, as you may see from the uh, map, the probably uh, the uh, Russian Tsardom wanted to make a buffer zone between Iran, Ottoman Empire, and Russia. Uh, but when the uh, Armenian population moved to Azerbaijan, Azerbaijani lands, we can see early uh, 1905 and 1907, Armenians started territorial claims against Azerbaijan. Uh, this is the first 
lights of the conflict, actually. Uh, can we go? Yes. Next, uh, I'm briefly uh, touching up on the uh, main topics, uh, but after the uh, World War uh, I, Azerbaijan proclaimed Azerbaijan Democratic Republic. This was a uh, very unique, uh, I mean, development in the history of Azerbaijan. Azerbaijan made this republic uh, as a first Muslim uh, parliamentary democracy in Muslim world and uh, among Turkic peoples. These uh, noble gentlemen, I can say some achievements of this republic. They, as I said, it is first parliamentary republic in the Middle East and among Turkic people. Uh, commitment principles uh, to democracy and secular and parliamentary states. Uh, this republic first time granted women uh, the right to vote much earlier than even United States and some Western countries. And in 1919, uh, Azerbaijan Democratic Republic opened first university. These are huge achievements, yes. Yeah. But, sorry. But when the uh, Bolshevik regime uh, invaded Azerbaijan and other Caucasus republics, the new period started in our history. Uh, Soviet Union also was very interested in bringing Armenians. Armenian population from outside. There must be very political uh, reason in this process because, you know, uh, in very different regions of Armenia at that time, I mean, experienced Armenian population. Probably Soviet Russia, I mean, Soviet Union to be uh, correct, Soviet Union um, thought to bring them and to strengthen the pillars of its regime. But it was at the expense of, it happened at the expense of Azerbaijani lands. Over the 70 years of Soviet rule, Armenians expel Azerbaijani from their lands. For example, uh, Zangazur is an administrative subdivision of Azerbaijan. I have very uh, too much statistic, but I don't want to waste your time in different years. Um, but in the following years, can we proceed? Yes. No, no, no. No, no, no. Uh, the previous one. Next one. Yes. But this part is the very beginning of the process. Caucasian Bureau of Central Committee of Russian Communist Party established subdivision of Nagorno-Karabakh. Because previously, we didn't have such kind of administrative division. But probably it was some kind of divide and rule policy. So uh, making Azerbaijani people used to new developments, to be comfortable. We can call this crawling strategy. So because in next two years, Nagorno-Karabakh autonomous oblast, oblast is in uh, Russian, uh, it's a Russian word, means county. Some administrative county. So they established. But after the uh, Glasnos and Perestroika in USSR, new phase, new attempts of Armenia um, started. They call it Haidat and Miatsum. It, mean it means that uh, Armenian cows and unification. So the basic uh, claim was that to annex Karabakh region of Azerbaijan to Armenia. And when the uh, conflict started, I, I, I need to show, this is the, this orange, oh, this is the Nagorno-Karabakh area, actually. Mm -hmm. 4,000 square kilometers. But they didn't stop uh, with that. They occupied other annexed territories as well. So it means that, you know, this is the Nakhchivan Autonomous 
Republic of Slovo Azerbaijan here. So they cut all connections. So we experienced very hard days. It was very beginning of our independence, uh, I mean, independent days. So when the, our national leader, Haider Ali, came to power, first we, as the ambassador mentioned, we got ceasefire, Bishkek Protocol in 1994, and then um, diplomatically, military, economically, we, we uh, tried to prepare ourselves to make our territorial integrity. But what happened during this war? It's, it's the first uh, Karabakh war. Can we go to the next? Yes. These are the consequences of this brutal war against Azerbaijans. The occupation of territories of Azerbaijans, it, uh, it's, it means 20% uh, of our lands, ethnic cleansing, social economic consequences, illegal settlements in the occupied territories, exploitation of territories and resources of Azerbaijan, environmental damage, damage to cultural heritage, humanitarian consequences. Uh, in order to have an imagination about, about these results, I will touch upon only two items. Ethnic cleansing, can we go? The one, yes. 20,000 people were killed. 5,000, uh, 50,000 uh, 50, people were wounded, became disabled. 4,000 citizens of Azerbaijan are still missing. Kojali massacre. Uh, Human Rights Watch descri described this massacre as the largest massacre in the country. During the two-hour Armenian offensive, 630 Azerbaijanis, including 106 women, 63 children, and 70 elderly people were killed. 487 others critically injured. And the social economic consequences, according to the evaluations made by the government of Azerbaijan just before the Second Karabakh War in 2019, 900 settlements, 150,000 houses, 7,090, uh, 93 public buildings, including uh, educational facilities, kindergartens, healthcare facilities, you see uh, the number, sanatoriums, treating facilities, all destroyed, pillaged, or plundered. So, actually, uh, when we had, yes, go ahead, please. Here, just sample, uh, I mean, some samples, photo for your Im uh, imagination, for your uh, attention. This is bread museum, roti museum. In Azerbaijan, bread is very sacred food. Even in our daily life, you can see that average Azerbaijanis, when they make swear, they can swear on the bread. So this is very sacred food. So we made museum dedicated to the bread. Yes. It, it uh, established in 1983, uh, right? But after occupation, this is the ruin of same museum. Another, yeah, this is the same museum. You can see the ruin of ruins of museum. Next, please. Yes, this is another museum, Kalbajar Museum of History and Ethnography. It was created collection. 30,000, rate of occupation 1993, and rescued object zero. You see, very furbished, very prosperous, but this is the today, after occupation. Next, please. Yes, Uzeyar Hajibeli. Uzeyar Hajibeli is a very uh, famous composer of Azerbaijan. He is also founder of Azerbaijan classic music. He is a person like Mr. Rami in Malaysia, right? You respect him, you, he is very, yes. Is this in Azerbaijani? Uh, yes, composer, artist. He, I mean, established the classic music of Azerbaijan. It's, it's his, I mean, home in Shusha city, right? Very uh, nice, very beautiful. But after, he's composer. But this is the result of hate, you see. 
there is nothing to refrigerate this building but pain. It was real. Krusha. Next one, please. Yeah. Yeah, the ambassador, yes, uh, said very important topic. This is not result of military, I mean, clashes. Nothing, uh, I mean, to do with the military. It happened after military war. They came back, they found these us to cleanse, to, to, yes, to destroy, to plunder, to pillage, to clean. Yes, yeah, exactly. Uh, but, you know, in 2020, actually, despite the ceasefire between Azerbaijan and Armenia, during these 30 years, we experienced some military clash along the borderline, I mean, front borderline, front lines. But, please, all the, yes. But when it comes to the September 27, uh, 2020, Armenia started new, launched new military operation. But thankfully, our army made counter operation and it took 40 day, 44 days. That's why in Azerbaijan we call this war, Second Karabakh War, as a 44 day or patriotic war. We liberated our lands. Uh, Yes, next one, please. Yeah, but right after the war, initial balance of the damage of religious and cultural monuments, here is the sum uh, information. Okay, more than 200, uh, 2,600 historical, cultural, religious monuments in the liberated territories of Azerbaijan. Uh, almost uh, 700 of these monuments are re registered. 11 monuments, World has world uh, significance. I mean, six uh, architectural, five archaeological objects. You can see monuments of national importance and local significance, including gardens, parks, monuments, statues, and applied art objects. When we, uh, I mean, went back to the our liberated lands, we found all these, I mean, ruins. I mean, actually, during the ceasefire, we, time by time, we were receiving some reports, especially scholars, visitors, I mean, visiting that lands. But that time, we saw by our own eyes what happened. Next one, please. Okay, but what happened to mosques as a religious, I mean, um, monuments or objects? 63 mosques in Karabakh out of 67 have been completely destroyed by Armenian forces in the conflict, while four mosques have been partially destroyed. This is the report from Azerbaijan National Academy of Sciences. They sent a mission and they made a report right after the war. Next one, please. And I will show here some sample photo facts. I mean, what happened to our mosques in the liberated areas before occupation and what we found after occupation. This is Karabakh Mosque, you saw very first girl is happy, right? And green even during the Soviet Union. You know, because uh, even the Soviet Union, we had some rights to keep our religious heritage. This is uh, Akta Museum, and this is another view. You see uh, cars, old Soviet cars, Jiguli, Yes, and our mosques and minarets, and just a, a photo from a usual daily life. And next one, please. Yes, Azerbaijani Muslims praying at that same mosque, okay? And um, I mean, even the, uh, during the Soviet Union, some, uh, some amount of people were allowed to, to make prayer. This is, yes, the, the next one, after occupation, the same mosque, you see, you see, the same mosque. And I uh, want to go back to the, uh, His Excellency's remarks. When we found these minarets, 
uh, yesterday it wouldn't be so kind to keep safe these minarets. But our military professionals told that because the whole city is like a plane, in military operations, Armenian army needed some coordination for the missiles. Okay? Okay? So there is not there is not any building, so they needed these minarets. That, that's why they keep time. Yeah. For military purposes. Yeah. And next one, please. Yeah, this is just very, this is very humiliating. This is not good, but sorry for these facts. I have to show you. You see, you know what is it? Okay, we understand during the military clash, war, uh, buildings can be, it's expected to be destroyed, right? This is war. This is military clash. But if you use something like that, if you turns Muslims' mosques into pig shed or car barn, it means that we want to humiliate, right? The secretion. Yes, they took the photo. It's, I mean, uh, from Armenian photographers. So, you know, to, to discourage Azerbaijan, never think about coming back, okay? So, you see, I think there is nothing to talk much about this picture. This picture speaks out. The same most thing. I'm not sure if you can see yeah, this is another picture. This is after occupation. Is it still like that? Huh? Is it still like that? No, 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 no. I will tell you. <laughs> Alhamdulillah, after the liberation, we went back. I will tell you. But you know, as I, I, I want to say, I want to reiterate again. This is not war. This is just, just discourage people. Azerbaijan is not so You already lost everything. You cannot come back. The separation. Yes. Next one. Yeah. Uh, sometimes in literature it's called urbicide or urbicid. What does it mean? Urbicide is a term that literally translates to violence against a city. The term was coined by English writer Michael Moorcock in 60s. It means that physical destruction of a city, I mean, uh, which I mean, refers to urbicide. We have three kinds of urbicide or urbicide. Indirect urbicide, direct urbicide, and extreme urbicide. Indirect urbicide actually involves measures and acts which contribute to the detriment uh, detriment of an urban area. For example, some municipality laws, okay, which is not active, which might be not active, but it, it can make damage to the, I mean, urban areas. This is indirect urbicide. Direct urbicide is some kind of acts, some kind of activities which can make physical uh, damage to the city's urban areas. For example, if one man municipality makes building in the green areas, in the park of the city, this is some kind of direct urbicide because you, uh, because you spoil the city, I mean, our, uh, the green potential of the city. But extreme urbicide, this is intentional uh, make intentional damage to the city, not only destroy physical buildings, also clean, I mean, destroy its identity. In Azerbaijan case, we experience extreme urbicide. Why? As we see the previous pictures, they ruined our mosques. They tried to discourage us. They tried to clean the identity of whole city, whole occupied territories. This is the disaster. So we call, that's why extreme urbicide. Yes, next one. Yeah, but this second war ended uh, after 44 days and uh, brokered by, we had a ceasefire based on trilateral statement brokered by President of Russia, uh, Mr. Vladimir Putin, and now 
Azerbaijan started post-conflict rehabilitation, reconstruction, reintegration. I want to come back to your questions. When the trilateral statement signed and we started huge reconstruction works in the liberated territories. And our president publicly declared that we will invite friendly countries to make investment to work here from green energy to civil work, civil construction, to electricity, I mean to alternative energy. So right now, uh, you can, if you check just briefly, if you Google what's happening in the liberated territories of Azerbaijan, you can see. Can we see? I want to show Dr. Uh, Azizan some sample pictures. Our president is checking constructions, works in the liberated territories, and buildings, new buildings, or restorating uh, the ruined buildings. The next one, please. Yes, huge works, I mean, making roads to from Azerbaijan mainland to Karabakh region of Azerbaijan. It's the value, it means that victory road. Azerbaijan president personally, I mean, integrated this road and some uh, memory, picture of memory, the sign, in front of sign. Next one, please. Yeah. This is the same mosque, Alhamdulillah. Our president with his family visited and, you know, furbished with the carpet, okay, praying. And this is the outside of the same mosque. I mean, we came back. May 13, 2021. The next one, please. Yeah. Of course, when we came back to Azab, actually, Karabakh, especially Shusha city of Karabakh, throughout the long history was the art capital of, art city of Azerbaijan. Even during Soviet Union, we had many cultural art events in the Shusha. When we, I mean, uh, restored our uh, sovereignty in this territory, the art and cultural program also started. This is one of them. Uh, after a long period of time, Shusha again hosts many cultural events. Karaburgi is a, some kind of local flower. Uh, we name these events under the same name, Karaburgi. Azerbaijani musician, artist, and wide crowd, including even uh, foreign guests as well. I mean, we are, you know, uh, probably Shusha and Azerbaijani people trying to heal our past wounds by doing this. We are gathering, we are playing music, making art, to remember old days, to forget the past wounds. This is some kind of, I mean, self-rehabilitation. The next one, please. Yeah, this is some theater, I mean, uh, performance from Azerbaijan and even I mean, probably from Western countries come making art plays. Yeah, yeah. We must know this flag. Right? <laughs> yeah, Azerbaijan, uh, Alhamdulillah, Malavaki, Malaysia, in Baku, yes. We organized the food, international food in Karabakh, in Shusha. We invited all embassies, including Malaysia. This is the, this gentleman is ambassador of Malaysia, Malaysia, bringing uh, Malaysian cousin to represent your delicious makam in Shusha. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, it happened this year, 2022. And this is the Malavake team, and some probably cook from Malaysia, mm -hmm. joining our celebrations. Then is it delicious? Sorry? Is it delicious? Yes, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Yes. It's time to talk about UNESCO Azerbaijan Cooperation. Sorry. In this regard, we have two main historical turning points. Before 2020, it means that before Second Karabakh War and after Second Karabakh War. Official relations between Azerbaijan and UNESCO started on June 3, 1992, just a few months after restoration of our independence. We 
restored our independence uh, in 1991. So a couple of months later, we started to cooperate with UNESCO. And cooperation between Azerbaijan and UNESCO developed steadily, become a reliable partner in ensuring peace and security in the world on all international platforms, as well as UNESCO. In 1994, Hedar Aliyev, the national leader of Azerbaijan, issued an order to establish National Commission of the Republic of Azerbaijan for UNESCO. This is the main government agency dealing with UNESCO. The next one, please. Yeah. We have some achievements during that period. In 2004, Her Excellency Mirban Aliyeva, first pres vice president of Azerbaijan, was awarded the title of Goodwill Ambassador of UNESCO. Due to her hard efforts in protection and development of Azerbaijan's verbal folk literature and music heritage. Over these years, three tangible and 15 ten intangible heritage samples of Azerbaijan have been included on the relevant lists of UNESCO. Azerbaijan was elected member of UNESCO Executive Board for 2021-2025. By the way, in this election, many thanks to the government of Malaysia, we were, Azerbaijan was supported. We have very, by the way, I want to say something as an aside. Uh, we have very powerful, very strong bilateral relations. But besides bilateral relations, Azerbaijan and Malaysia enjoys, very, enjoy very strong relations in the international organizations as well. This is the one sample of that cooperation. Yes. So three cities of Azerbaijan, Baku, Ganja, Gabala, are included in UNESCO Global Network of Learning Cities, Learning Cities, and uh, Baku, Sheki, and Lankaran cities of Azerbaijan also included in the UNESCO Creative Cities Network. Azerbaijan uh, very active in UNESCO projects as well. Uh, we support programs and projects of organization through the Trust Fund, which established in accordance with the frame, framework agreement signed with UNESCO 2013. We try to make some, I mean, financial donation for UNESCO projects. So very successful cooperation, very successful. And let's go, yes. What happened after November 2020? Okay, right after the trilateral statement in December 2020, UNESCO, released a press release, I mean issued a press release on sending of a mission to Azerbaijan. Actually we were very surprised because the war just ended, you know. Immediately after this press release, spokesperson of Azerbaijan MFA um, made another press release saying that, you know, uh, it's not understandable for Azerbaijani side. It's not understandable because uh, in the past years, several times we requested UNESCO to send missions, but it was rejected, very clearly, very blatantly re rejected. Uh, we also tried to explain the UNESCO officials that, you know, that the war just now ended. And these lands, Almost all these lands are landmine. If you send some mission, it can make serious danger for them. So we cannot take this responsibility. We declared this very clearly. Um, yes, immediately present. And we also uh, remind the UNESCO <coughs> officials that in 2015 report of the same organization, the UNESCO by itself accepted that the Armenia, the government of Armenia rejected mission. I mean, we, that time we requested to send mission, what's happening to our mosques, I mean, cultural heritage. They blatantly clearly rejected. This is the, I mean, as a solid fact in 2015, I mean, UNESCO report. We also uh, remind them, the next one, please. Yes. Yeah. 
And after that, our Minister of Culture uh, also launched a preliminary, uh, pre preliminary monitoring of cultural property in the liberated territories. And um, we can see the same strong position of the Azerbaijan MFA in June 2021, when government of Armenia demanded to next time demanded to organize a UNESCO fact finding mission to investigate the liberated area of Azerbaijan, Azerbaijan issued the second press release. And um, in February 2022, Azerbaijan uh, made another statement requesting fair and equal treatment from UNESCO. So, you know, we, we believe that UNESCO must fulfill its mandate in an independent and objective manner and not allow the issues of protection of culture to be politicized. This is the main position of Azerbaijan. If you, I mean, the, our position is very clear. If you want to be accountable, you have to be accountable for both sides. You cannot listen to just one side story. You have to be fair, you have to be equal. This is the very simple, very clear, I mean, point we expect from UNESCO, actually. The next one, please. Okay. And in the course of meeting the held on video conference for on, on, uh, I mean, in February 2022, with the participation of the President of the Republic of Azerbaijan, Mr. Ilham Aliyev, President of France, Mr. Emmanuel Macron, President of European Council, Charles Michel, and uh, President of, uh, Prime Minister of Armenia, Mr. Nikol Pashinyan, it was agreed to send separate missions to UNESCO, of UNESCO to Azerbaijan and Armenia. This is very important, I mean, turning point. At last, Armenia agreed. But unfortunately, it didn't take too long time. As several weeks later, uh, the government of Armenia, I mean, postponed this mission. Then our request is still in effect. We look forward, you know, as I mentioned in my previous slides, Azerbaijan looking forward right now only to rehabilitation, reconstruction of our liberated lands. And we think that you, you cannot change your neighbor, but you have to find common language with your neighbor. That's why we very stick to peace, cooperation in our neighborhood. But you know, to achieve these wish, these, I mean, expectations, anyway, you have to find some common denominator. And you have to work with international partners. In this regard, we see UNESCO as a reliable international partner. But one thing, you have to be equal. If you send mission to Azerbaijan, you have to do the same thing with Armenia as well. This is very clear. This is very unequivocal. Next slide, please. Yes, I want to conclude, I want to sum up uh, a quotation from my president. In uh, Economic Cooperation Organization, my president declared that we must combat Islamophobia and promote true values of Islam, peace, tolerance, and justice. In this regard, we welcome the decision of Organization of Islamic Cooperation to designate 15 March as an international day to combat Islamophobia. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you, uh, Dr. Rafiq. That was very uh, enlightening for us because, uh, to be honest, uh, if you do not have, we do not have this talk, <coughs> and you did not come to our place uh, at early this year, I think many of us, even ourselves, are not familiar with Azerbaijan other than what we hear in uh, on TV and all. 
but it is very different of course hearing uh, looking at something on TV and I think to, to a certain point we have also become desensitized because we keep saying it's good that there is all this technology but at the same time we are seeing it day by day to a point of we're just like okay another war another whatever it is so it's very different to hear it uh, yeah, face to face and to have both you and uh, His Excellency to talk about it uh, and, and, and that was good. Of course there's some light moment about how uh, our Songko, maybe yeah. the origin of Songko in yeah. Nusantara might be from so Papa, yeah. maybe? Maybe. Yeah. But anyway, uh, personally, this yeah. is, I'm not expert on folkloric studies, on traditional national yeah. codes, but my uh, belief is that, yes, our grandfathers exchanged some experience. Yes. They traveled here, probably yeah. from here yeah. to Azerbaijan. But yeah. anyway, we have some, we had some contact. Um, yeah, and this, I mean, uh, as you have mentioned, uh, the first person, the, the somebody who came to Indonesia. Yes, to, Sheikh Nurana yeah. yeah. Ibrahim. Yeah. And I mean, Indonesia, I mean, this is the Duta Besar Indonesia, yeah. believes that He's the first person brought Islamic religious to the Indonesia. I see. All right. Uh, personal, I guess this is the wider you sometimes. Yeah, yeah. Yes, yes. Yeah. Of course. So I think uh, that was uh, very, as I said, very enlightening. Uh, it's something that, at least for us, it's also uh, a reminder that war is just yes. a no-no. In, 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 you know. Uh, Unacceptable. Uh, yeah, because Result. not just not just physical structures get uh, yeah. destroyed. Of course, human lives and of course uh, the identity and cultural everything is just affected. Okay, uh, but congratulations on the fact that uh, the country and the people has managed to rise above it all. Things are getting. You are, you have passed that forty four days of. Uh, War. Of course, there is still a lot more to do, but the last two years, we are now in 2022, so a lot has been done, as we can see. Uh, I, I, we are glad to see that. Congratulations. Okay, uh, so now uh, we would like to open up the session to question and answer. Uh, I would like to ask anyone who wants to ask a question to maybe introduce yourself first so that we know uh, more about the person, of course, you could also interact with him later during lunch and all, but it would be just nice for us to know uh, who the question is coming from. So, without further oh, wow. Prof. Azizan, straight away, she's already like ready writing to the question. Okay, <laughs> Prof. Azizan, you don't have to introduce yourself. <laughs> okay, thank you. Mm. History, the history of the religion that you talk about. I was just wondering if the animosity between Amelia, what, what we understand from the tradition, was it deep rooted in history? Why? Uh, why? Did it start hundreds of years ago? Or was it something that after you were colonized by Russia and some political thinking came to be? Do you yes, want to? Uh, that's all. Yeah. yeah, exactly. You know, um, if I was, for example, uh, instead of ruler, yeah. so I mean, we know from the political history, rulers generally 
prefers to find flavors because if many people, I mean, if regions uh, need need you, so you will be powerful role. But the another important thing is that you know, I think our grandfathers didn't expect we will experience such kind of clash conflict. Okay, the one, first thing is related with the Russian strategy. As I mentioned, it wanted to make a so-called state, cutting connections between Iran and Ottoman Empire, mm. and between the um, I mean Muslims under the Russian rule. Okay, this is strategy. But second, this is my personal view, is that it's mainly related with Islamic tradition of Azerbaijan. You can ask why. You know, the institution of Hijra, Muhajira, is very important. If a, I mean, uh, welcome someone from outside in Islam, we share our bread, right? We can give shelter. This is very important. We know. Huh? You, you say in Muhajira, yes. This is the philosophy of Muhajira, Hijra. Because we know it's from the religious of Islam. Probably we didn't expect. They are newcomers. I mean, uh, but. The strategy of the Russia was different. They always, I think, uh, encouraged uh, Armenian population to see or to be powerful and to make some land grabs. This is the, I think, uh, just the beginning of the history. But of course, you know, um, I think intellectuals of every community, every society, every country. Uh, the burden of intellectuals is also very important in this regard. Probably we will learn to live together uh, in the next years, in the next centuries, by recognizing ourselves, by I mean, shaking our hands. But now we are trying, uh, my uh, president, several times declared that we are very open to cooperation. Let's, I mean, uh, turn the new page. Turn the new page. Because we know very hard, very brutal uh, facts and experience from the history. We have to do something new. It's okay. Uh, being a central dialogue, we, we always put a, a preemptive emphasis on the dialogue. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm sure dialogues are easier said than done. But isn't there any kinds of uh, initiatives from civil society in Armenia and in Azerbaijan to to, you know, very to, good to, to bypass the political mm. system? You know, surely you can't just depend on the political system. Okay, uh, I uh, wouldn't uh, say classifying uh, politicians, but they happened very important thing after 30 years, very long time. The first time, just several months ago, our foreign ministries had direct phone call. This is very new thing. I mean, Fifth Minister of Foreign Affairs of Azerbaijan, yes, took the phone and called his counterpart of Armenia. So this in, can encourage, I mean, relations. But now, as I see from the media, uh, in some European countries, I mean, especially if I'm not if I'm mistaken, please, my ambassador can correct me. Some Azerbaijan youth organization has some uh, basic contact or communications, okay? Just testing. Because the war just, we lost, Armenia lost, I mean, our soldiers, our people, okay? This is the very new phase of the, I mean, peace or ceasefire. We can understand, we can, we have to observe what happened, what should be, I mean, what we must do again. That's why it will take time. That's why I said to Too rehabilitate soon. ourselves. Too yes, just so. But anyway, there is a will on, I can, I can talk on my government's behalf. I can talk on behalf of Azerbaijan. There is very powerful, strong will in Azerbaijan's side. We are extending our hand. Probably, our counterparts, I mean our neighbors, also will understand the situation. As I mentioned, you cannot change your neighbor. You have to find common language. Mm -hmm. yeah.
But there is a hope on the horizon. As I said, this was a very, very uh, powerful turning point when Azerbaijani and Armenian foreign ministers, I mean, ministers called each other threat. So there is a hope on the horizon. Sounds good. Yeah. Yeah. For 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 the future. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think we are we are glad to know that you know that means uh, Azerbaijan and that region is also going. The Azerbaijan main country, of course, mainland is all okay, uh -huh. but this region in the middle there. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. If there is a war, Azerbaijan is located in a South Caucasus. Yeah. It's not that much. I mean, big regions. If you compare other big big regions of the world. Yeah. But if there is a war, it means that it. I uh, block everything from economy to social relations, mm -hmm. cultural relations. So we don't need this war. Yeah. I mean, this conflict. So inshallah, we will achieve it. We will make it. We okay. will be able to make good, it. Good, good, good. Yeah. And that, another question? Anyone? Okay. Oh, okay. Sorry. Yeah. Peter, oh, Peter. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Peter Wong. Peter Wong. From, uh, uh, I have two questions. First one is uh, uh, Dr. Rafi mentioned that ninety-six percent of the population in Azerbaijan is Muslim. Muslim majority. Yeah. So uh, over the years, uh, I see the basically it's an oppression of the Armenians against uh, uh, Azerbaijani uh, religion as a tool for political oppression. Do you see that? Yeah. My other two. Uh, Another question is, uh, uh, do you see Mr. Putin as a friend of all? Sooner or later, <laughs> somebody's going to ask. Not my ambassador. <laughs> 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 somebody's <Because> going to ask. <laughs> yeah. Uh, 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 okay. I will uh, answer the first question, your question. Very interesting. From the beginning of this war, to be honest, Azerbaijan never saw this conflict as a religious conflict. But probably, you know, in the Western countries, Armenia, you know, in foreign policy, we know, uh, we have some tools. I mean, sometimes identity can be used uh, for, the, for the agenda of foreign policy. Probably, uh, Armenia used this identity in the relations with Western countries. But we never, never, uh, so this conflict as a religious difference. You know why? Because even today in the capital of Baku, uh, you can find very furbished, very prosperous Armenian church. We never tell. We never. I mean, because we understand that, and right now you can find uh, 30,000 Armenian books in that church, religious book. Even in the brutal phase of the war, no, I mean, no one touched uh, Armenian church and other church in the other uh, administrative divisions of Azerbaijan. So from the beginning, uh, on our side, this is not religious conflict. Um, but what I showed you, I mean, in my slides, this was, you know, just cultural religious attack from our neighbors, as I said, to discourage us. This is the, you know, sorry for my term, this is the dirty side of the war, you know, propaganda. Okay, in the war, unfortunately, some these kinds of, I mean, uh, things may happen. But we want to forget, you know, we want to open new page. Yeah. Okay, there was some dirty things, okay, yes. yes. This is not good pictures from Azerbaijani monuments, but guys, let's have common language, okay? Let's talk each other and don't, yes, let's, I mean, not to leave these bad experience to our younger generation. Let's live together. This is the, our main standpoint. And the next question about Russia and Azerbaijan, <laughs> my old ambassador. Yeah, he has a great experience. I would, <laughs> I would like to add uh, to Mr. Uh, 
respond to the first question. More than 30,000 of Armenians are still living in Azerbaijan, in spite of the Even conflict, now. in spite of the war, and so on. More than 30,000. And they have, and never, have never had any problems with Azerbaijanis, with Azerbaijani society. In my neighborhood, there are, have been living in several Armenians, and they have never faced any problems. And besides this, in Azerbaijan, as Mr. Stradafik said, we have a Muslim majority, about 96 persons. But besides it, in Azerbaijan, we have Christian community, Orthodox, Catholics, Buddhist, mm. uh, Krishnaist, and so on, so on, even Jewish, uh, very good Jewish uh, community, and so on. And we have never, throughout our history, we have never had any problems, inter ethnic, inter religious problems in Azerbaijan. Only this conflict with Armenians, and uh, it uh, was created artificially. I, I, I can say uh, that as is, uh, Professor Aysan also asked about this. This problem emerged only after uh, the occupation of our territory. During the Muslim states, during the, the Azerbaijani, Qajarids, uh, Afsharids, Safavid dynasties, e even in the Ottoman Empire, Armenian ha had never had any problems. They uh, made their trade, they worked and, uh, in very good conditions. Even in Nagorno-Karabakh, we have five uh, Armenian uh, possessions. Uh, it's not, it was not Armenian, but uh, Christian possessions. Uh, and they had their internal uh, how to say, rules, internal self-governance, and so on, had never any problems. But after, as Mr. Rabik said, uh, Russia created this buffer zone between Azerbaijan, between the uh, Muslim population of Azerbaijan, and between Ottoman Empire and between Russia, this such kind of uh, problems emerged. But in Armenia, if you look at the statistical data, 99.9% of, of Armenian uh, population are Armenians. It was not so during all that time. Uh, to, uh, when uh, this Irevan Khanate of Azerbaijan, Irevan Khanate, was occupied by Russia in 1828, 90% of this country were Azerbaijanis. Azerbaijanis. Only 10% uh, were Kurdish and Armenian population. Uh, and now there is uh, in Armenia no Azerbaijan is living in Armenia. Only very very small Yazidi uh, Kurdish community. And the 99. 0.9% of Azerbaijan is uh, at the same time in Azerbaijan we have more than 15 nationalities are living in Azerbaijan. We have many, many uh, <coughs> minority, ethnic minorities living in Azerbaijan without any, even within our embassy, you can find uh, representatives of some uh, national minorities from Azerbaijan. And uh, in regard, <coughs> regarding the second question, it was about Mr. Putin's position. <laughs> Mr. Putin is the president of Russia. He, it's, uh, he is not our enemy. He is not our friend. He is the uh, head of uh, <laughs> state. And uh, today we have very good relations <coughs> with Russia. It's our strategic partner, uh, our very great neighbor with, uh, in, in, in the means of foreign trade. Russia is the main destination for Azerbaijani non oil uh, export. It's uh, the huge, hugest uh, trade partner of Azerbaijan in non-oil sector, I mean. mean uh, we have very good uh, relations, very confident relations uh, between our president, uh, Mr. Aliyev and uh, Mr. Putin. And we are thankful to Mr. Putin for his uh, moderation of the, this, this uh, trilateral document, which uh, put an end to this war. And now, uh, Russian his keepers are stated in uh, some parts of, uh, of Karabakh where they fulfill their obligations as uh, peacekeepers. After three or four years, they will they leave this region after the sign and peace agreement with, uh, with Russia, uh, with Army. Uh, if you mean, if you ask this question as a uh, uh, reference to Ukrainian uh, 
Russian work. Uh, Ukraine also, our very closest, uh, one of the, our closest uh, strategic partners, we have very good relations with them. And uh, at the same time, we are for the uh, unconditional fulfilling of uh, norms and principles of international law. We didn't recognize annexation of Crimea. We didn't recognize annexation of parts of Ukraine by uh, Russia, by other countries. At the same time, we, are, uh, under, we understand the, uh, how the concerns of uh, Russia about security, about its security, because you know uh, Russia said that uh, Ukraine must not be a member of uh, NATO. Uh, and uh, if uh, Russia uh, is feeling such a danger from the side of NATO, NATO must uh, negotiate with Russia to, to, to resolve this conflicts, this disputes. Uh, at the same time, as I said, we uh, don't recognize and uh, we never recognize annexation of Ukrainian parts by Russia, by other countries, as we don't recognize the annexation of Georgia, uh, Abkhazia region, South Ossetia region. Uh, we don't, uh, as well as we didn't and don't recognize uh, the occupation of any territory of any country by others. We stand for equal, fair uh, fulfillment of uh, norms and principles of international law. If you... Uh, yes, okay, another question? Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Rafiq, for the wonderful session. Perhaps if you can elaborate a little more about Malaysia yeah. relations. My question is, yes. um, I think people from the yes. here, maybe are yes. Malaysians, would like to know more yeah. about uh, the relations between Baku and Kuala Lumpur. I know we are going to celebrate our 30th anniversary next year. Yeah. So, so maybe you know of interest yeah, yeah. to the peer. You know, Petronas has I've written a bit about that. Yeah, and both our countries. countries uh, non-alignment foreign policy. I think that also to the extent answers Mr. Peter's question when it comes to the Ukrainian yes. war. We both countries share this policy of non-alignment. Russia is our friend, so as also we support Ukraine. Isn't so we are non-alignment. Both Kuala Lumpur and Baku practices that policy. Perhaps you can elaborate a bit more about Malaysia um, and Azerbaijan and efforts of Malaysia to support Azerbaijan in the UN resolutions and all. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Yes. Okay. Very, um, thank you, doctor. It's very important. I if you want to talk, speak about relations between Azerbaijan and Malaysia. Yeah. From the beginning of our uh, relations, I mean, it happened in 1991. Uh, oh. We restored our independence. We have very strong relations based on mutual trust and respect. First of all, we are part of members of, proud members of Organization of Islamic Cooperation. We have huge and great experience of, uh, I mean, cooperation in that regard. So as you mentioned, we are members of uh, NAM, Malayan Movement, and right now, as you may know, Azerbaijan chairs the NAM. Um, so, but on the other side, as an embassy, we, we are dealing with this kind of issue. We think that there are huge potential we can cooperate on, from education to trade, from commerce to culture. But what happened in recent years, I mean, due to this, due to this pandemic, uh, there was some interruption. But, uh, you know, we are doing our best efforts to advance on this way. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. That's good, you know. Yes, exactly. Oh, so I learned. First of all, thank you, Rafiq, for sharing the um, significant uh, talk on Azerbaijan. It makes us understand uh, more clearly on what you have shared. 
have two questions. First is, um, that you mentioned on collaboration for education. Yes. So, um, is there a plan for uh, exchange student, exchange student program perhaps for Azerbaijan and Malaysia? And secondly, uh, what are your expectations towards the MMS program? The good thing is that from the very <laughs> beginning of my ambassador's material here, he started, I mean, he gave very, I mean, high importance to develop relations in the university. Mm. Probably we can't talk much on that topic as well. But right now we're including the University of Malaysia as a leading, as one, I mean, leading, I mean, higher educational institution in Malaysia. We have some cooperation. And the, another good thing is that my government, government of Azerbaijan, from 2007, if I'm not mistaken, started a special program. I mean, financing Azerbaijani students I mean, to be educated in oh. at yes, leading university of world. And um, we are talking with our minister of education in this regard. And we started some basic programs. Uh, it's now ongoing. I mean, as an ongoing program, probably we will have good messages in the next months or next year. Oh, at least that what we can do, mm -hmm. what we can do. Probably there are some, for example, uh, areas very interesting for Azerbaijani universities and students. For example, Malaysia's uh, Islamic finance and halal industry. Wow. Very new areas for Azerbaijan. So we can say, we can talk about this as well. Mm -hmm. So uh, let's wait. Let's wait for some feedbacks from Azerbaijan. And my ambassador is working on it as well. Just a couple of uh, weeks ago, he had some meetings oh, at the Ministry of Education. And uh, very hectic schedule. We are working. So, I mean, the education is very important <coughs> pillar of our work here. Mm -hmm. So we will come <coughs> very frequently to your Eastern University. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 Yeah, this is so a this, room. this room. Yeah. Like, uh -huh. This room. 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 This uh, children who are affected by the war and became, and became disabled. We are yes. special education needs children. So will there be also policy in uh, special education for uh, My government has, but another topic, you know, I thank you for reminding me. Probably I had to tell about um, this in my presentation, but it's not too late. You know, as you saw, there is I mean, the Karabakh war, I mean, liberated territories, from the scientific view, is very new case. And University of Malaysia is very experienced edu educational center in this, uh, not only in Malaysia, yeah. in wider Southeast Asia and in the world. So it would be great if you send mm -hmm. some kind of scholars, some kind of scientific mission, just to visit that, I mean, mm. uh, territories. I mean, make some search even to research. talk with yeah. disabled, I mean, yeah. uh, mm -hmm. persons, mm -hmm. I mean, innocent civils. And, you know, it would be, it, it would be a yeah. good beginning for even for your investors. Yeah. You know, you will so you will make your report and what we can do, what kind of, I mean, common uh, cultural heritage we have there. And uh, anyway, mm -hmm. <coughs> make huge contribution to the Malaysian sources. Yeah, Swaila is, uh, I think, very much interested in special education because that's what she's doing uh -huh. for uh, her study, for the studies. Uh, I think that's good. I think now that you have mentioned about grant and research, I mean, yes. UM time stuff. Time we declare, yeah. we issue, yes. Let's be, I mean, so, stay in touch. Yeah. So if you have a collaboration, for example, a partner university in in Azerbaijan, we can do on a certain topic and can apply grant from the embassy. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think I think that's 
if you have budget, yeah, of yes, course, of course, you have. Time, time by time, <laughs> time by time, our Minister of Education right. and several yeah, that's government cool. yeah. agencies, I mean, share, declare, yeah. yeah. the great pleasure. We'd yeah. like to have our Malayan brothers and sisters in Azerbaijan. Because making I have. Scientists, yeah. research, making papers, reports. Yeah. Yeah. So Be the case is uh, now is at the very beginning phase. Yeah, <coughs> yeah it's so just starting. You can go witness by your eyes make your reports yeah. and uh, inform mm -hmm. Malaysians. Yeah. Yeah. So we can go that way, yeah. Yes. Because when I uh, check on, you know, Googling on Azerbaijan and all, I know you have like about like seven universities uh, and especially the one in Baku. They're good universities. Exactly. Music and, yes. you know, different different universities. Huge facilities you yeah. can yeah, go visit. But as I mentioned, my ambassador is also here. Yeah. We are very open yes, to work with you That's in this regard. Okay, uh, if there is, I think it's been long. Uh, if there is no other question, uh, I would like to invite uh, to for Prof. Azizan to, pass, uh, to give our token of appreciation to Dr. Rafiq. Yeah. Kind of you. Yeah. Ah, Kali. Let's say both. This picture is supposed to bring us back our company. <laughs> yes. Thank you so much. Okay, so uh, now, thank you very much, Dr. Rafiq. Please take your seat here. Uh, I am, I think we will get uh, the uh, closing first. So I, I'm, I'm now, I am just going to pass back the question to uh, one. Thank you. thank you, Dr. Luya. And of course, thank you to Dr. Rafiq uh, for the acceptation. Um, okay, without further delay, Mr. Mak Faizal, are you ready? Okay. I would like to now invite Mr. Mak Faizal from Angkatan Belian Islam Malaysia to deliver his closing remark. Please welcome. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh Guest of honor, His Excellency Irfan Davudov, Ambassador of Republic of Azerbaijan in Malaysia And uh, Dr. Rafiq Rustamov, Councillor of the Embassy of Republic of, of Azerbaijan Tanesh Tiramizan Memna Oldum And uh, Prof. Dr. Azizan, uh, Director of Center for Civilization and Dialogue, UM uh, Prof. Duria Sharifah Hassan Adli, uh, Advisor to University of Malaya, UNESCO Club, Puan Suhaila, uh, Prof. Wendy, I can see Prof. Roy, Tony Rogers, and all members of the floors from ABIM Secretary and not to forget Dr. Rajma, uh, a renowned diplomat. When I was in Global Model United Nations program, when I was young, now I'm still young. <laughs> uh, I learned a lot from Dr. Rajma about diplomacy. And she said to me, diplomacy is the art or skill of saying no without saying no. So, you have to learn a lot from Dr. Najma about negotiation and diplomacy. Dato' is still young. Yeah, still young as well. Thank you, thank you. First of all, uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Rafiq, for your sharing insights about what happens in Azerbaijan, the occupation, uh, Armenian occupation, and we can see the war. And of course, uh, if you look at the sentiments of the Muslim uh, world, of course, all over the Muslim uh, world, supporting Azerbaijan and Turkish in taking back the Armenia. And we can see the implication of the war. We can see um, how uh, the suffering uh, uh, faced or encountered by the Azerbaijan, Azerbaijan people through the photos uh, shared by uh, Dr. Rafiq. And it was devastating and of course infuriate, infuriating as well and untenable. And that's how we can see the implication of the war and that's why we need to fight against any war 
or invasion uh, in this world for international peace. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, um, on behalf of Abim, uh, we are honored to be part of this event. Thank you, Prof. Dr. Aziz, for inviting Abim. Uh, uh, it is a kind of a pleasure to be part um, in uh, maybe uh, sharing our common grounds, especially in terms of finding uh, solutions for the international peace or even to have encouraging dialogue with uh, many uh, uh, quarters uh, in Malaysia and also abroad and especially through Azerbaijan and of course as you know Azerbaijan is no stranger to the process of building civilization I could say Azerbaijan blessed at the very strategic location um, uh, it was exposed to the Silk Road during the, during the ancient time in history and when we talk about the ancient uh, history or the Silk Road, Azerbaijan also uh, was part of the process in building the civilization. And since then, we can see interactions throughout the history uh, through trading from the Far East, i.e. China, and to the end of Europe, Venice, were encouraging. And uh, it indirectly opened the door of interactions to the world, when we can see not only through trading, but also through other aspects, culture, religion, and also knowledge and technology and so on. And it, become, it, it became a vital aspect in building and sustaining the civilization. And when we talk about Sikh Road, I would like to just uh, recite a, a verse in the Quran about Quraysh. Allah mentioned in the Quran, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim, li'ila fi Quraysh, ila fi himri halata shita iwa saif. Allah said, for the accustomed security of the Quraysh, meaning the Quraysh people, it was accustomed for them to do trading. Rihlata Shita it was safe. They are accustomed security in caravan of winter and summer. And when we talk about winter and summer, winter is winter was in Yemen and summer was in Sham. Sham means Syria, Jordan, Iraq, where it was included within the Silk Road that I mentioned just now. And through this process, uh, through the, the strategic location, uh, including where Azerbaijan is situated, it became a fertile crescent. It is very uh, strong word for Tigrisen during uh, ancient times where we can see civilization keep replacing from one to another because of this uh, encouraging in terms of trading uh, and so on. And this remarkable fact also uh, was shared in this region, in, uh, in Malaysia now, we can say, or the Malay Archipelago, where Malacca also was a strategic uh, uh, place we have the Malacca Strait and we also have a trading but the only difference was because uh, was we use the maritime road instead of Oasis Road uh, in uh, Azerbaijan. So looking at the bigger picture we can see now interactions, engagement, amenable to cultural diversity, uh, dialogue are paramount and a profound basis in building the civilization and it is very honored to have civilization and dialogue very Im high impact program in the high impact research building <laughs> organized uh, co-organized by the center for civilization and dialogue university of malaya and also with our fellow abim friends uh, students and also uh, lecturer academic staff and uh, thus we should promote a new way of looking the civilization uh, as sharing interest between human beings under the efforts and that's why Abim came forward to bring the idea of cosmopolitanism. The cosmopolitan meaning we share interests, we share common grounds, we share technologies to build or to have more prosper civilization in the future. So dialogue matters, uh, promoting civilization and dialogue, promoting uh, interactions, engagements really matters in sustaining the civilization. So when we talk about civilization, I would like to conclude with what was said by even Ton B uh, when I was in uh, other program in the UM. Uh, uh, Anak Ton B, the historian, said that uh, there is no clash of civilization. Uh, so we, we should debunk the book of the clash of civilization by Samuel Huntington because when we talk about civilization, it's, it is all about sharing interests, sharing uh, prosperity common ground and so on for the better life of human beings. So thank you very much. Thank you again, His Excellency, and also Pro Rajma, Pro Azizan, and all academic staffs.
uh, Abu Abim friends and so on. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. I'd like to invite you to give the token of appreciation to Mr. Mohamed Faizal, please. Yeah. Yeah, I see probably that, so for example, thank you. Mohamed, can you please come to you? Oh, yes, please, Datuk. We're honoured to have you, Datuk, please. Yeah, okay. Datuk, Datuk, stand back to his basket. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Oh, that's right. Uh, UNESCO Club. University of Malaya was the first university to have a UNESCO Club in the whole of Malaysia. And 